Hi, Sophie. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. And welcome to the Snack Covenant episode 306. I'd like everybody to close their eyes. Picture the waves, a beautiful beach, the water is hitting your feet. And as you look into the distance, you see somebody with us. Hello, <laughs> it's me, the Lore Hunter. <laughs> it's the Lore Hunter. Wait, was he in the ocean? Uh, yeah, I came out of the ocean. Oh no, throw him a life jacket. <laughs> An interesting thing happened recently. Sophia and I were working on our schedule for the recordings, and we're like, oh my god, we have a really good idea. We should have the Lore Hunter back on for the F series. And then, upon further digging, we realized we never had the Lore Hunter on, and we thought we did. <laughs> Maybe it's like a Mandela effect where there's a different universe where it <laughs> happened, <laughs> but we're in this one now, so. Exactly. So, <laughs> welcome, Laura Hunter. Hello, happy to be here. It's nice to have you on, apparently, for the first time. Rising out of the ocean. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, for anybody who's new to the podcast, could you please tell us about yourself, what you do, stuff like that? Sure. I do YouTube videos about Souls games. Yeah, my channel, Lore Hunter, Twitter, Lore Hunter, talking about Souls stuff occasionally some other video game stuff, but that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, and you've been following Elden Ring since before Elden Ring was even conceived. Yeah, it's, I've been following it for far too long, yeah, since <laughs> been hitting it hitting it hard since 2019, because you know how From Software likes to, uh, you know, announce around E3 and then release the game the, the following spring. You know, plus or minus two years. Late at night, I think of you, your vision floods my mind. So, today... We're talking about Elden Ring, and specifically, we're going to talk about artificial life. There's a lot of artificial life in Elden Ring. Sure is. Yeah, you got your Crystallians, you got your marionettes. The Elven Oryx. Yeah, yeah. Let's look at one of them specifically. The Crystallians. Right. How would you describe the Crystallians? So the Crystallians are real, real bastards, at least <laughs> gameplay-wise, made of crystal. <laughs> And uh, their origins are kind of weird. They have some creator, and they were carved from crystal. And I guess they have a little bit of a hierarchy in a society, but they mostly are known for their uh, like deep cogitation or deep thinking. And they're mostly waiting for their creator to come back to make more of them. And that's an interesting point, because if they're waiting for a creator to make more of them, they can't reproduce on their own. So whenever we kill someone that's a Crystallian, we bring them closer to extinction? Yeah. That's pretty <laughs> mean. <laughs> I know. I, know I, I read that. And I was like, ooh, that's a little bit of a bastard thing. But I mean, who, who aren't we bringing closer to extinction? Yeah. That's a good point. And so do you have any idea on who's making them? The Crystallians are a weird one in particular that I, you know, it's tough because like Lyernia is such a concentration of, you know, glintstone and crystals and it's bringing up like the the onyx lords and stuff who we know came in on like a meteor uh, there's nothing to suggest that the crystallians also came in on a meteor but like everything about them like they're close to the primeval current yeah and like so it just they're very cosmic adjacent but it's interesting that there's nothing specific that brings it up but it would be kind of wild for them not to be adjacent to like the onyx lords and all that wouldn't you think so I was thinking last night about like what what's there to like link the Onyx Lords and the Crystallians like within the game because like he said it's sort of like it would kind of make sense for them to be connected because the Crystallians are connected to the crystals the crystals are coming from the stars of Glintstone and then there's the Onyx Lords it says like they rose to life when a meteor struck the point at which I was like I don't know though was like the Onyx Lords are always associated with stone they make things from stone and they are themselves described as being stone like. Whereas the Crystallians are all crystal, so it's like, that either means, like, they're not connected, or, like, the Onyx Lords, like, it's the stone people are making something from the crystal. The other thing that I was like, I don't know if they're connected, is that, like, 
again, like the, them being associated with two different things, the Onyx Lords are obsessed with pushing things away with gravity, and the Alabaster Lords pull things toward them with gravity. That seems to be the only difference. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, they're all gravity, gravity, gravity. And then the Crystallians, like, they're all crystal-based. They're not gravity-based. So it's like, if they did carve the Crystallians, they created something that was completely unlike them. Mm-hmm. Which is itself possible. The other, like, thing I was thinking of that, like, that sort of made them, like, not connected. The Onyx Lords, like, they're very sort of sparse. Like, they literally just wear a pair of underpants with (laughs) some little, like, sort of, like, runic, like, a belt around it. (laughs) Yeah. But then, like, the Crystallians, like, very, very finely sort of, like, wrought. They don't look like they're products of the same culture. Mm -hmm. The Onyx Lords, like, they look like they don't really care for aesthetics. Yeah, and the Crystallians have a fancy little scarf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then I was thinking, like, the one thing I can think of that sort of would connect the two geographically is that in um, the lead up to where the cloister is in the Lake of Rod, there's ruins you can raise up. On them, there's an alabaster lot. And then directly above them, there's this massive crystal that is, like, kind of coming down through the roof. And I'm like, okay, that sort of puts them next to each other, kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If the Onyx and Alabaster Lords are associated with anything, it almost seems to be the sort of the ruins that stick out of the ground that look like an earlier version of Faram Azula. Like, they they seem to be, like, they fit better with that, just aesthetically and, like, where you find them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And I was thinking, it sort of ties their other main connection is through the Academy and through the Sorcerers, because we know that the Crystallians have, they made some sort of deal with sorcerers at some point that's very hazy and then we know that like the onyx lords like they've trained with celia like and that they seem to be on relatively friendly terms there's the one in the academy and um i'm not exactly sure if that's friendly or not but they do sort of interface with the astrologers which Mm. may just be more of like elden ring everything is coming from space yeah Um, it but is it is it interesting because the Crystallians with the Primeval Current and the Onyx Lords don't really talk about that at all. So mm. that may be part of the difference. And um, if you look at like uh, like Lusat and the Masters, like they they become like crystally mm. when they get near the Primeval Current. So I guess that could be one of the differentiations. Is that doesn't really have anything to do with gravity magic. So mm-hmm. Glintstone is cosmic as well, sort of. You know, obviously, because with the magic downpour or whatever it is, the foundational rain or whatever, Glintstone came from the stars, too. Mm-hmm. So they just may also be another cosmic related thing. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like, that you bring up the, the presence of, like, the Onyx Lords and the Crystallians within Raya Lucaria, because if you look at, like, where they're all positioned within Leonia, it's the, the Onyx Lords and the Alabaster Lords are associated with the Karian royal family. Right down to there being, like, there is an Everjail with an Onyx Lord in it. I'm called the Royal Grave, which, like, could suggest, okay, it's an Everjail that happens to be by the Royal Graves. But could also suggest that, like, this person was actually part of the royal family. And is actually entirely possible given, like, Rani's obsession with gravity and and stars and stuff. Mm -hmm. We also know, like, Radan trains under an Onyx Lord to learn his gravity manipulation. Whereas if you go to the Academy, it's all about like the Crystallians came here and taught us their crystal sorcery. And like, there are like Crystallians on Rani's plateau. Yeah. Also like Rani's whole like little area is just covered in, in crashed like bits of glintstone. Yeah. You don't really hear about Rani hanging out with Crystallians. Like she's more interested in like the snow witches and things. The Crystallians almost seem to be a side effect. Yep. I was just, I'm thinking about adjacencies like, the Crystallians are like underneath that plateau as well. And that's like where the Albinorics are just bringing it around to like a bunch of artificial life is kind of concentrated there. Yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Lore Hunter. And I actually wanted to ask you to a question. The Crystal Torrent states that the wrath of the Crystallian is like encapsulated in sorcery. What wrath? Well, it's the torrent that goes. <laughs> oh, I thought it was they're, like a metaphor. For like, I don't know, they haven't resolved issues. <laughs> okay. Well, they do. I mean, they do. How so? Well, because they've been carved by something and like left behind on a planet to meditate and guard <laughs> crystals. Like, that's the other thing. Like, the Crystallians, they're hewn from crystal, but their their purpose is to guard crystal. Like, it says, like, we're actually yeah. just going to sit and guard this crystal. So, again, like, 
there's not really like that that doesn't fit with the onyx lords and the alabaster lords who are all just like gravity and meteorites mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like the reason i was suggesting like that they may have had a connection to the to the weird ruins that are sticking out of the ground is that like a few of those aesthetically have like a big meteorite like stuck in them yeah um which i know a lot of underground areas do but like if you look at the Divine Towers, they have little chunks of meteorite embedded in the side. It's like reverentially. It's not like a meteorite hit and bits of it were lodged there. Like they've actually carved little holes and stuck meteorites in them. And like it specifically says that like the Onyx Lords rose to life when meteorites were hitting the ground. Mm-hmm. So they they seem connected to meteorites and gravity way more than crystal. They don't seem to be like in tune with the primeval current. They just seem to like like smashing stuff. Yeah. 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 And you know the way the crystallians move? It's very mechanical. It's very non fluid. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's because they're made out of crystal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> it's not a particularly malleable substance. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's, yeah. You know, going to what you're saying too is like I mean, this is a tangent as far as being related to their movement, but it's sort of to paint a picture to me that maybe they're coming from an older age. Like you're, like you're suggesting is like with the divine towers and the underground ruins, like, you know, there's stuff that comes from space, but there's also stuff that's just really old. And, you know, I don't know exactly when that like raining fall of glint stone came, but it seems like maybe they were something that popped up in reaction to that, like ages ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, also if you're really old, it might be hard to walk around. So if they've been around a long time, <laughs> You know, also, the the joints aren't what they used to be. So So you're saying they're in their 30s? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) It's funny because all of us in this chat room are in our 30s. (laughs) We relate to the Crystallians. (laughs) It's my Crystallian age. (laughs) Yeah. So you mentioned that the Crystallians' point is to guard crystals. Why? Maybe I'll ask them. Maybe they know with their like with with their deep cogitation. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. they talk about being smart, right? You have to be really smart to wield their weapons or something. Well, yeah. it's, you basically have to be really smart to understand what they're saying because they're so quiet. <laughs> oh. It seems to be the takeaway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's uh, From Software President Hidetaki Miyazaki here, once again dragged away from working on my robot game because apparently this bunch of assholes don't understand the primeval current. So the nerds that listen to this probably already know the story about how the multiplayer in Demon Souls was inspired by the time I was stuck in a traffic jam, everyone worked together, we never directly communicated, we never knew each other's names, we never saw each other's faces, but we all got through, it was a beautiful moment. The primeval current, something that never seems to move, sends people insane and slowly transforms them into inanimate stone, is likewise based on my experiences dealing with the fucking traffic on the turnpike. So now that we cleared that up, I'm uh, gonna head back to working on an onion-shaped robot with a tragic ending. Do you have a final takeaway we should know about the Crystallians that you think is important? Um, they're, they're entirely stolen from fighting fantasy cabins of the Snow Witch. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we could talk about like that design um, that they have with like the sort of weird headdress thing. Yeah. I thought that was like an ugly haircut. <laughs> it kind of is. It kind of is. Yeah. That's like the that's the sort of de facto way of representing golems in a lot of fiction. Oh. It goes back to a, an old German silent film. I'm saying this as if there's new German silent film. <laughs> it goes back to an old German silent film called De Golem. It's about a golem. <laughs> and he has that, like, sort of strange headdress thing. It's one of those things that, like, Japan seems way more obsessed with this than the West. But if you look at Japanese depictions of, like, golems and things, and even, like, giant robots, they will frequently have that kind of head design to signify that it's artificial. Yeah, now that you say it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of Japan, let me go in a little tangent with the Lore Hunter. Lore Hunter. Yeah. What's your favorite anime? Oh, my favorite anime? Oh, 
putting me on the spot here. I am not a frequent watcher of anime. I would have to be very boring and probably go with Attack on Titan just because it is the one that I've watched with my partner. And um, it's a great show to like potentially have children walk in on. So really good, really good <laughs> memories of like, oh, lock the door. You know? So that, that, that's my fondest anime memories. Oh, what about you, Sophie? Well, Sin, there is a correct answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> it is, of course, Kotekyo Hitman Reborn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I, I was trying to remember what it was called because I've seen enough. <laughs> but I was like, shit, what's that thing called? <laughs> My name is Trisha, I'm a fragrance consultant, and I've been asked to talk about crystals. So a long time ago, I'm in Celia with my friend and our other friend who we don't talk to anymore, and there's this lady there, and I think she's Scottish, and she seems like super stressed out. So we talk to her, and we're like, what's up? And she's like, I seek the primordial crystal. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety from you. The best crystal to deal with that is rose quartz. So I'm trying to convince her to just like get one on Etsy, but she says no, she has to have the one that's in the cave. And I say, okay, well, why don't you go and get it? And she says, because the crystals in the cave have something called scarlet rot in them. And I'm like, okay, I see what's happened. Crystals absorb vibes. And if you go in there with that bad attitude, you're gonna make it worse. So leave your bad vibes at home, come back again later, and try using sage. Anyway, then this guy in really ugly pants showed up and she said she had to leave. I think it was her ex. She was weird. So there is a variety of albanorix in the game. How many varieties are there? Two. <laughs> there's, there's two what are called um, generations of albanorix. But then, like, there's there's a fair amount of variety within what are called the first generation. Yeah. Yeah, there's the Albanorix that look kind of like the Chapel Dweller, I guess. That, that yeah. literally are the Chapel Dweller with a different head. <laughs> it has those. <laughs> and then there are the ones who are kind of like either archers or mm. wolf riding archers. Yeah, yeah. And then there are the cutest kind, which are the second generation Albanorix. Mm. And... Lore Hunter, could you describe them to us? Sure, they look like uh, frogs, and um, they do the best movements in the game, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Which is is a tangent, but I just can't get over the fact that you know you make the first generation, their legs don't work so good, yeah. and so you want to you want to make up for that, and you 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 just really highlight it by making them cartwheel everywhere. <laughs> You're just like these legs work so good, you could cartwheel. <laughs> Well, no, they're like, what's something with very strong legs? A frog. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's, they somewhat overcorrected in their design. Okay, we gotta Google this. Do frogs do cartwheels? I, w- I would say no, but who knows? They I'm might do, they might do like backflips and forward rolls. <laughs> I just found a video. Oh no, it's just uh, somebody doing a cartwheel like a frog. Okay. Aw. But you know there are competitions, like frog competitions, because you have your frog and you train it to jump really far. And then you compete with other people to see whose frog jumps the farthest. (laughs) You think that's the genesis of the second generation (laughs) Albanorix? It's just just like (laughs) a frog (laughs) contest at Raya Lucaria and they take it too far. (laughs) Well, they are artificially created, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, you're just doing this hand of like, therefore it logically <laughs> follows. It logically follows that it was a frog race. <laughs> Hi, Sophie here. You're probably thinking to yourself, you know, we've had two completely irrelevant digressions so far. Surely this one will be something to do with the actual game. Sam so wants me to talk about frog racing. Frog racing forms the basis of episode 8 of the classic Australian kids TV series, Round the Twist, in which Pete puts his underpants in the microwave, causing them to develop superpowers, but also shrink until they only fit a frog. 
Said frog is then entered into a frog race in which it leaps so high it escapes the Earth's gravitational pull, only to then rocket back down again, landing atop its competitor, splattering them across the audience and its distraught owner. This is not depicted as cheating, while the owner of the now graphically deceased frog is. I learned nothing. Back to the podcast. It's kind of interesting because the difference is not only that they can cartwheel, which is obviously the best part, <laughs> but like they are not like they don't speak. They're not really intelligent like the first generation, which to your point, like they seems to me like they're intended to be more like as like laborers or to do to do work versus do like thinking and stuff like the first yeah. generation. So mm-hmm. it is interesting to see that as another change to them is what the original use may have been. Also like, again, going back to the like Caria slash Ray Lucaria split, the Albanoric seem to be like associated again with the Carian Royal family. Mm-hmm. Like you have, like they have a, an Albanoric servant. So Pity is like an Albanoric who just works for them. And then when you read about, like, there's the Albanoric blood clot that's used in, like, a weapon. And that weapon's used by the Knights of the Cuckoo. And especially, it specifically says in the description, like, this is designed to hunt Albanorics, and then, like, your blood is, like... Oh, hang on, I wrote it down. There's so much. Sorry. Behold, thy defiled blood. Yeah, unlike any humor that flows in the land or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so the Knights of the Cuckoo, who are, like, the soldiers of Raya Lucaria, they basically going around like just killing Albanorix. You've also got like the marionettes. Like Raya Lucari is the one with the marionettes. They're defending like that area, whereas Caria, like Caria's got Celavis, but that's a slightly different situation. Yeah. Because like Celavis is making puppets, not marionettes, which like annoyingly are completely distinct things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you get this sense of like, um, yeah, like these artificial life sort of like changing between the two. And um to me, like, the big difference between the Albanorics and the Crystallians is that if you look at the Crystallians, they're created to guard crystal, and that's all they ever do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, they're totally chill, just sitting there meditating with their giant crystals behind them. Whereas the Albanorics actually, like, they do a whole proletariat rebellion. <laughs> like, they actually, no, they actually say, like, we deserve something better than this, and they, they go on this, like, march to the Halig tree. Some of them end up, like, working with Mog. But, like, actually, it's the second generation mostly that work with Mog. But the first generation actually say, like, you know, we're a persecuted people. We need to go somewhere else. So the notion of creating them purely as a workforce, like, however, for whatever reason they were created, they seem way, like, not necessarily more intelligent because the Crystallians are described as enormously intelligent, but they're much more sort of self willed. Yeah. 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 That's a really good point because Crystallians are told, guard these crystals. And they're like, yeah. we're so intelligent. We're just going to guard these crystals. <laughs> Yeah. And these guys, the Albanorix, they went out, they read some Karl Marx, and they're <laughs> like, we deserve better. Essentially, yeah. Yeah. And like the Albanorix are also, they're persecuted just in general, like there's an omen killer that is murdering yeah. them. Um, and it talks about like the Albanorix, because they're artificial, they're sort of outside of the cycle of the earth tree. Yeah. And that makes them something that's lesser. And like when, you, when you're fighting them, like their blood is white. Like there's something about their blood that's like not quite like it's 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 not quite a proper like fluid and you know the first yeah. generation like their legs are withering away. Um, it's interesting like when they talk about it because it's not like they're born without legs and then that's just what they're like. It's like what's Albus straight up says like my legs are going and I'll go soon as well. Like they start to sort of like disappear from the feet and mm-hmm. it like carries up. Um, yeah, so there's, like, something about them that's, like, incomplete. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, too, about something. Because you have the Albanoric blood clot, and it states that, you know, Albanorics are life forms made by uh, human hands. And the blood clot looks a little bit like silver. It's, like, reminiscent yeah. of the mimics, maybe. Yeah. Very, yeah. Yeah. And then you have the blue silver armor which is something that i think the first generation albanorix yeah 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 and it states you know blue silver is a metal born from the same mother as the archers themselves what does that mean okay 
<laughs> so um, I've had a look at this a lot because there's there's a very large Alpinoric that you meet in the Consecrated Snowfield. And um, if you bring Latena there, she says, like, you know, assist to take the... She calls it the birthing droplet. And she's like, we'll yep. create more life. And that led to this whole thing about, like, is she really big because she's giving birth to them all? And it's this whole back and forth about what what is the droplet. But, like, it seems yeah. very much like the droplet is... It just means, like, a droplet of silver from which the Albanorix are created. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense, because there's also, like, uh, some items who talk about the primordial drop, and they talk mm. about, like, ripples, which are reminiscent of the creation of Albanorix. Yeah, and, like, we, we just did an episode um, about Marika, where we talked about the way that the, the Eternal Cities, like, they created life there, and the life was in the form of the Silver Tears. And the Albanorix seem to be like, they maybe tried to copy that, because you can see there's a lot of, like, um, Nox influence in Lyonia. Like, the the Church of Vows just straight up has a statue of a Nox in it. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, Rani is sort of like, she's obsessed with the Eternal Cities and all this other stuff. Yeah. So you get the sense that, like, they were trying to copy that. And also, like, in the Albanoric village, you find one of the, the tier items you use to rebirth yourself. Yeah, that specifically says like this stuff comes from the silver tears of the eternal city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you have the uh, ceremonial tier too, which is relating to the church of vows, which is like the hidden tier. Yeah, so I, I've generally thought that yeah, like, they must be adjacent to the mimics and a derivative of Noxtella, which is you know which ties pretty well into Liernia and Rhea Lucaria and the Carrion sort of having a lot of inspiration, if not having like descended in some way from the astrologers and stuff relating to the eternal cities, they seem mm-hmm. very much connected. And you have that with Celia. And I, I was thinking a bit about how like it was probably natural for like Radon to go there and study with an Onyx Lord, but it seems pretty implied. Like you mentioned that the Carrions probably have connections with the eternal cities to some degree, which is very interesting because looping back around that starts to bring America back into the fold when they're presented as such different groups, but they have almost a similar potential lineage, which is interesting and complicated. Like a lot of the stuff in Elden Ring. (laughs) Hello everybody. The podcast is now about two thirds done. So please take this opportunity to stretch. As you can see, I am now in HD. We'd like to thank our wonderful artist, Holdsworth Hands, as well as our cultists and patrons past and present for making this possible. And now, back to the podcast. So now, part trois of this deepest podcast ever about artificial life. Puppets and marionettes. Mm. Go. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll bring out the marionettes because they're, you know, they're basically created by sorcerers just to do shit for them. And yeah. they wear buckets and what look like weird corsets. Yeah. They're, they're just, they, the all the descriptions relating to the marionettes are like, these guys are shit and... <laughs> sorcerers <laughs> don't care about them at all so which is pretty in line with how rea lucaria yeah. treats artificial life <laughs> yeah Aww. and they're like they're like a much more um quote-unquote successful attempt to just make a servant yeah because they just do yeah. the one thing yeah they just go yeah I, I i love their animations i will say it's like <laughs> as an enemy design like it's such a from software like they yeah. like when they go like like go crazy and start spinning around like <laughs> it is it is some very good animation that does yeah. straddle that line of like like a threat but also very stupid like in, yeah, in a really yeah. great way yeah yeah <laughs> so who created them it just says the sorcerers did it which ones the ones in riley Lucaria. what are the names uh olvinius um <laughs> Car- carlos <laughs> The the two of them, those two brothers, yeah. <laughs> all right, they're yeah. not brothers. They just they just like the stick yeah. heads together. They've all got the same beard. It's very confusing. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like Bloodborne where it's like there's one guy with a beard, so you can always tell who it is. <laughs> so the life we talked about before 
is sentient, basically. Yeah, yeah. What about these guys? They just seem more like they're programmed. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's this whole thing in Raya Lucario where, like, they have the marionettes and they also have the Knights of the Cuckoo. And I don't quite know which one came first. But, like, the Knights of the Cuckoo, like, the whole point of Raya Lucaria is that they're a bunch of scholars. They don't have, like, a great amount of military power. So they kind of contract the Knights of the Cuckoo to be their military. And, like, the Knights of the Cuckoo, like, they're described as, like, they didn't really have an aptitude for magic. So the scholars created what they called the faux sorceries. Like, we'll just make these things, like, this can sort of mimic magic because you can't do it. But then they also make the marionettes. And, like, I think there's probably more marionettes around now than Knights of the Cuckoo. There's a description that's like the Knights of the Cuckoo sort of like, they went off and did their own thing way too much. Yeah. Yeah, they went around pillaging. Yeah, like they had free reign to do what they wanted. I guess like the marionettes may even be like an outgrowth of that. Yeah. We're hiring these humans, but they just go off and do their own thing. So we need something that's more reliable. Hmm. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder because, you know, rolling into the puppets is like, the downfall of the cuckoo is that the carrions like turning them into puppets, which mm. sort of backfires when it helps bolster their own force yeah, using, yeah. using the Academy's resources. So if you're talking about which came first, it's kind of interesting to wonder, like, did they make the marionettes then? Because that's something that, you know, they couldn't puppet potentially. I mean, yeah. it's hard to figure out if there's like a evidence for that in game, but like just trying to figure out if, if it was a reaction that, could make sense i mean if the knights of the cuckoo also if they just got decimated when they attacked yeah. aria like it would make sense we need a replacement military <laughs> yeah. and also like you you see the marionettes in a lot of places yeah but actually the first time i played it i thought oh is the idea that like they're artificial so they can't get scarlet rot so they're using these to mm. like safely navigate yeah. crystallians get scarlet rot and they yeah but they're more sentient though well we talked about scarlet rot before where like Scarlet Rod is, like, not really, it's not a disease. I keep likening it to the black goo from Prometheus. But it's that. It's, like, reshaping everything into a certain, like, kind of world. Um, In the same way that, like, the Erd Tree is doing that by, like, making everything golden. The Scarlet Rod is making everything into a weird fungus planet. And it works as a disease because, like, if you get it in you, it starts changing your body and making you sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, the cure is gold. So, like, it's not a normal disease. <laughs> like, you can have so much scarlet rot that your limbs fall off and then you, like, stab yourself with a needle and it goes away. <laughs> because the needle is gold and it's, like, repelling the god of the scarlet rot. So it's like a metaphor. If you're rich enough, you can get rid of the disease. I mean, basically. Basically. Whoa. <laughs> and even, like, in a weird sense, like, the kindred of rot are also, like, I don't want to say artificial, but they seem to spontaneously generate. Like, they just grow out of the out of the yeah. scarlet rot like they just arise from it oh, oh. yeah they they, yeah, they just yeah scarlet rot is a, a tangent but very interesting because it's yeah. like it's like what if cosmic radiation also made life yeah <laughs> like just just like pop out of it so yeah, yeah that's that's not artificial but the pests are yeah they're yeah. they're also just popping out of there along with uh yeah i mean I recently made a video about it, so I was wondering. It seems like you get that whole biome is just mm. packaged in whatever Scarlet Rod is because it just, you know, it's like the Zerg or something from StarCraft. Yeah. It just <laughs> creeps along. This is a weird tangent, but it made me think of Godzilla. Um, the very, very first Godzilla, which is like if you if you only know like Godzilla is primarily like a kaiju series about monsters fighting is completely out of line tonally with everything else. It's this enormously like downbeat, miserable film. The sort of thesis of the first Godzilla is like, humans created the atomic bomb, which made parts of the planet uninhabitable. But if this like monster can live in that part of the planet, and we can't, then like it deserves to live more than we do. So that's kind of the te- like something I got from Scarlet Rot, where like we're interpreting this thing as a disease that's like killing everything, but it's just something that we can't interface with. Like it's producing its own life. It's producing its own animals it's producing its own like fungus things it's producing butterflies to the things in the scarlet rod that's normal and everything else is poisonous but yeah back back, i guess to like the puppets like the the puppets themselves you see physical one like if you go to cellar this is creepy basement (laughs) yeah his little his little sex dungeon yeah you you can (laughs) see like you can see the jar right and you can see therolina and there's like an omen killer and a bunch of other stuff down there. This is something that originates the Eternal Cities, the puppets. 
you see it with the the Nox, the Nox Sword Mistress and Night Maiden. But like it says, okay, these people became puppets of their own will. Um, hmm. I guess similar to the way that like Latena becomes Ash of her own will. Yeah. Yeah, and the puppet is like it's just a soulless body essentially, which. Again, like this is tying into more of the themes of Elden Ring because you have like again, there's an item description that I can't find now because there's too many of them. But it, it mentions <laughs> that like the Glintstone sorcerers, like they grow to see mind and body as entirely separate things. And like what is a puppet? A puppet is a body without a mind. And like you have Selen, like Selen can just transplant her consciousness into different bodies with like a shard of Glintstone. Like, the Crystallians, in a sense, like, it's, like, artificial life. It's made from crystal. It's tied to the primeval current. Selen is also obsessed with the primeval current. What happens when you get too obsessed is you literally turn into rock. And you have sort of implications with, like, Estelle in particular, but also the Falling Star Beasts. That there's, like, those things have chunks in their heads that look like the Glintstone crowns. Um, in, Is it Lusats that's, like, massive? He's got, like, it's, like, a big bobblehead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Think, yeah, yeah. It's I get them confused. Um, yeah. yeah, that's Lusat as as he is the the um the green one. Lusat's crown, like it looks like an eye, yeah. and specifically, it looks like the eye that's in the middle of Estelle's head and in the middle of the Falling Star based heads. It specifies that like when they become a graven a graven mass, that the graven mass can kind of become a star eventually. And God, there's they really there's a room in Raya Lucaria. That confu- I wasn't sure who it was supposed to be for a while, but I think that's like Selen's study from before she was exiled. Yeah. Where there's like a single massive graven mass in the middle and just crystal everywhere. Yeah. And there's a portrait of Selen above the door. And I, I, when I initially got there, I'm like, oh, is this, you, f- oh God, what do you, you find some spell there. And I was thinking like, is this supposed to be like one of Selen's former tutors? Because the, the painting's facing inside. But then I'm like, no, it's actually Selen's room, isn't it? Because this is what Selen was doing. This is why Selen was kicked out, because she's experimenting with the primeval current. Which is itself like, okay, we'll, we'll invite the Crystallians over, and then they'll teach us about the primeval <laughs> yeah. current. But then I know we've gone too far. Um, reverse, reverse, reverse. Yeah, that, that's interesting, too, especially bringing in like Estelle and the Falling Star Beast and stuff, because the puppets are like this really heady concept of like, you've taken someone's fate, which is like, has to do with the stars as well. And the idea of like Estelle and something like, was it like, like Malborn stars or yeah, something? Yeah. And then yeah. you taking the graven mass and trying to create a star. So there's just this really weird yeah. recurring theme at the center of like stars as life, but not like truly like natural life. It's, it's yeah. Yeah. We, we've sort of talked about this a bit where like Elden ring uses the word star interchangeably for a whole lot of different things. Yeah. Yeah, so like it gets a little confusing about what's like what's a chunk of glintstone and what's a meteorite. Mm-hmm. Because like we was like looping back to the Onyx Lords, like the Onyx Lords are all about meteorites and gravity. And like Estelle is pretty big on gravity as well. Like he can like yeah. pull you in and push you out. Falling Star Beasts do it as well. But they resemble the products of the primeval current, but the primeval current is all crystal, so it's like all these things are kind of interfacing with each other. Mm-hmm. Hmm. The DLC will bring it together. <laughs> we all know it won't. <laughs> Sophie, do the outro. That was the Snack Covenant episode 306, in which we talked about artificial life in Lyonia and elsewhere with the Lore Hunter. Lore Hunter, if people want to find you on social media, on YouTube, and anywhere else, where should they look for you? Twitter and YouTube, you can type in the lore hunter and i will probably show up i haven't i haven't checked but i think i'd show up excellent and i highly recommend lore hunter has amazing videos insightful theories and the production values are just way cool yeah i got cheat engines so. <laughs> <laughs> wow thank you sophie thank you sam
Thank you, Lore Hunter. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. And see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. Say bye, Lore Hunter. Bye. Bye. <laughs>